Hi everyone, Ariana Friedlander here with Rosabella Consulting. Welcome to the Co-Creators in Conversation interview series, where we celebrate leaders who are challenging the status quo and creating economic value by caring about their people. Right now, I'm excited to be speaking with Kristen Riat, Executive Director of Bridging the Gap. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you for having me, Ariana. It's great to be with you. Oh, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be speaking with you and sharing your story with our listeners because I know you have a lot of valuable experiences and insights to share. Well, you're kind to say that, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, to get started, would you take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role at Bridging the Gap and what Bridging the Gap does? Sure. Um, so uh, I am the executive director of Bridging the Gap, which is a, um, a nonprofit founded 30 years ago by a Fort Collins uh, dweller named Bob Mann. And um, Bridging the Gap is now a fairly kind of a medium sized nonprofit. We have, I think today, 27 employees, uh, not all of them full time. We have eight different programs that have kind of emerged over the years. Um, in some cases, we folded nonprofits under our umbrella or we've given birth to new programs. And as a result, we have one of the widest spans of environmental programs of any nonprofit, certainly in the Midwest. So we work on trees, we uh, do prairie conservation and restoration, we have a green business network, mm -hmm. we go into lower income households to install water and energy efficiency devices. And so we keep ourselves off the streets with a lot of different kinds of activities. Um, and a lot of our work is fueled by the labor of uh, local volunteers. And in a normal year, 1,800 of them. And even in the pandemic, I think we had about 1,200 of them. Wow. We were still able to work together because we were working outside. So we're, we're very busy uh, working on both the vegetation, the infrastructure, uh, the green infrastructure of Kansas City, and also um, the uh, lowering of greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with overuse of uh, coal-fired electricity and that kind of thing. So energy and water efficiency, vegetation, and we also have a workforce development program. Wow. So super duper comprehensive. That's really awesome. Uh, and you mentioned too that Bridging the Gap was founded by Bob Mann, who some people that have been following my work for a while might know Bob is one of my mentors and I've written about him in my book and in blog posts. And so that is the Bob Mann. Um, and that is one of the reasons that I was excited to speak with you because of, you know, that tie in we have um, with him as a mentor and, and also recognizing you know, Bob is this incredibly charismatic, visionary person that is amazing at capturing people's attention and, and getting people, when he started bridging the gap in the 90s, it was a really radical idea. And he got a lot of buy-in and support throughout Kansas City for it. Uh, so I'm curious to hear from you because a lot of the people I've spoken with so far on this series are in new roles, either because it's, you know, a new role within an established organization that they stepped into and, and created uh, with, with other people there, or they founded the organization that they work for. You have this unique position of stepping into an existing and organization that's disrupting the way things are, are going and following in the footsteps of a charismatic visionary leader. What has that been like for you? Tell us a little bit about that experience. Uh, well, I think, um, as I mentioned to you, that's known as Walt Disney syndrome. After Walt leaves, it's kind of tough to, to fill his shoes. Um, you know, there, there were two other uh, briefer stints of executive directors, all men, between mm -hmm. myself and Bob Mann. So um, it wasn't a direct following, but still, it, it, in terms of the employees, there were still employees who had started out with Bob Mann. It was uh, a little bit challenging. And I think partly the gender thing had a role to play in that. Okay. I think it's a, that women um, claim their power, if you will, and exude their authority in a different way mm -hmm. than men do. Uh, and I think that's really for all of us 
no matter whether you're a man or a woman, to find your own way, um, uh, your own management style, your own um, communication style, uh, your own messaging. Bob, Bob had wonderful principles that he laid down for the organizations that we still adhere to these, this, these days. But I added my own to that. Mm -hmm. um, I still adhere to Bob's, but I've got some of my own as well. Um, so it, it wasn't an immediate thing. I've, I've been an executive director for almost 12 years now. And mm -hmm. I think it took me time to figure that out. But I would say identifying your truths with regard to the cause that you're serving, uh, crafting your message and being able to speak that message with uh, conviction and passion mm -hmm. is certainly part of it. I feel like um, I, I had come to the position also with a lot of management experience at Hallmark Cards and I evolved part of my management style there. Uh, which is, as you can imagine, it being Hallmark Cards, not a very confrontational management style. Mm. Um, and so I would describe my management style as kind of servant leadership. I really believe in that, that the leaders of an organization are there to make sure that their people have what they need to do to flourish. Mm. So that's it kind of in a nutshell for me. Yeah, and that's so relatable. I know for me, I, I've also not as directly, but kind of followed in Bob's footsteps at Shadowcliff, right, where he's the leader, and then we step in, and and there's this challenge and opportunity in in driving an innovative effort after a leader like him, and and for both of us specifically, him, um, where where we need to honor that past, and at Shadowcliff right. past goes even further back, you know. Uh, so we need to honor that and while also charting our own path forward. And yeah. that can be a really tricky and awkward place to be in. Yeah, um, I think to you certainly need to allude to the past and honor it. But in terms of feeling intimidated by it, I haven't felt that to be particularly useful. I think in that sense, you need to just kind of get past it and move on. Uh, but we... We definitely talk about Bob all the time. Um, I, I just trained somebody yesterday and was talking to him, to them about him. But at the same time, it doesn't sit on my shoulder very much. Yeah, we have to be our own leader, our own person when yeah. we follow in those footsteps. It's not we have to be like him or some other leader who came before us. We need to kind of, I love what you said about the principles, right? Like, those principles yes. are foundational and, and we still ascribe to them today. And we also, you know, have to work within what's been an incredibly dynamic and changing marketplace and world um, in the last 12 plus years. Well, and that's one thing that that's, you know, the founder very quickly recedes into the background in part because things just are changing so fast and there are new young people coming into uh, bridging the gap into any organization that you're associated with all the time. So mm -hmm. that uh, you can't afford to spend a whole lot of time hunkering down in that. Yeah. And I wonder if there's, you know, because we do have so many um, people that are involved with the co-creators and conversation series that are, are the founders in some way, shape or form. Do you have any advice for them about how to navigate that transition successfully based on what you've experienced and seen there at Bridging the Gap. You mean when a founder needs to step down and has yeah. decided their time is, is, uh, is over with? Yeah. Well, I just think that, um, I mean, certainly I've had the benefit of Bob still being around to ask questions and being completely open and supportive of me. And I would certainly want to offer that to anybody who followed me. And I'm sure that all of our listeners would want the same thing for their successors. I mean, you want the organization to succeed more than you have ego wrapped up in your, your part in the organization, hopefully. Anyway, so yeah, be as supportive as you possibly can to the people who will succeed you and uh, be available to them in, to help in any way. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate what you just said, too, about that keeping the ego in check, right? That it is, the commitment is to the success of the organization and fulfilling the mission, not to making 
someone else feel good um, and, and stroking their ego. And that right. leads me to one of the other things we discussed. I'm curious to hear your experiences with and, and you know, um, maybe a specific story if you have one around as a leader, how do you create space for people on your team to change you and change your perspective uh, and open your eyes to new or different ways of doing things so that you remain a relevant service provider in the area mm -hmm. that you are mm -hmm. at? Well, you know, managing people is the hardest thing, but also the most rewarding thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard in that we're all so different from each other and understanding that is the work of a lot of communication, a lot of time, a lot of data points. Um, and But it's something that you really have to invest in as a leader. You have to get to know who your people are, what they're motivated by, what they're best at, and then link that up to the problems at hand. So I said service uh, leadership is one of my philosophies, but I would also say that strengths-based mm. uh, management is a philosophy as well. I'm way more interested in what people are really good at and how we can shore that up. I mean, definitely we have to also shore up the areas that they're not as good, but uh, people flourish where they are, where their best qualities are appreciated. Mm -hmm. And they, I believe, will bring out, um, will show you hmm. far beyond what you expected yeah. if you give them the confidence and the support and the belief in them that most people need. So uh, I've had no trouble getting to know my team deeply, I'm, but I'm extremely fortunate in that each one of them is so dedicated to our cause. You don't go to work for a nonprofit that pays way less than a corporate um, entity would uh, without being passionate about the cause. And in our case, environmental issues are becoming emerging uh, as part of the national and the international landscape more than they ever have before. And so we're all super excited about what we do. We're, we're charged up to do it. And in some cases, it's just for me to coach somewhat support somewhat and then get out of the way so that people yeah. can demonstrate what they do best. And in the process, I mean, partly because we have such, um, such different skill sets on our staff. We have a mm -hmm. forester on staff. We have people with deep uh, human resource experiences with mm -hmm. a lot of justice and equity uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. My learning curve, I mean, it never ends. It's straight up and it's constant. Yeah. And that's been one of the great rewards really of my work. That's so cool. And, and I wonder, is there a specific example of a time where you were working on a project and the knowledge and experience of a staff member impacted your perspective and how you, you know, decisions that you made about how that project was implemented or where it went? You know, I, I, I'm not going to mention a specific story, but I, I do want to describe a specific person. Um, which is our CFO, Becky, mm -hmm. who I don't think she would mind me telling you, uh, lives completely off the grid between Lawrence and Topeka, Kansas. Mm -hmm. She lives in a hundred square foot garden shed that she fitted out with solar panels and has a very tiny little air conditioner for the summertime because otherwise she'd be dead in Kansas City. Um, she has a little uh, stove that's about the size of a coffee can, an old-fashioned coffee can, oh, wow. that she fills with kindling at night, and that's her heat in the wintertime. Mm. And out of this humble place, and it, of course she grows her own food, she has a greenhouse, she has a composting toilet, she won't buy anything that isn't fair trade clothing, and she won't eat anything that involves um, exploitation of animals in any way. But she is so quiet and so modest about this mm -hmm. that all of these things she would never push any of this on anyone else um and I think and and she has the most unerring instinct for justice she's a white woman but her understanding of justice is all pervasive uh, indigenous peoples 
people, black people, Hispanic people, gay people, old people, young people, anyone who's not being treated or, or being categorized and perhaps not being treated equally because of those demo, their demographic characteristics. Yeah. And I, that her unerring moral compass has taught me more than all the years that I spent at Hallmark, which is mm -hmm. more than 20 years, um, and has been the probably the leading light of my time at Bridging the Gap. Even mm -hmm. though I love our other, I love every one of our employees, but it's Becky who has turned my head around about what we need in life and what's important in life. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm there yet, but she teaches me every day. And can you give some examples of the ways that she's changed you? I mean, just hearing about the way she's chosen to live her life is really inspiring uh, and, and impressive. You know, it's, it's not common. It's not, for, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say, for example, I came to Bridging the Gap with a whole lot of interviewing experience because mm. we, I worked in the creative division at Hallmark and we're a large division and we went out recruiting all the time. And we, it was our um, joy to recruit from historically black colleges in the, in the 90s. And we were extremely mm. successful with that. So I thought I knew a fair amount about interviewing before I encountered Becky. Mm -hmm. But Becky taught me not only the law about what it is that you can and you can't say. I knew something about that, but not like I do now. What it is that you can and can't say. What it is that's ethical to say hmm. uh, or not say. And how we need to treat every candidate with the same open mind that hmm. and, and really cultivate awareness of our own biases. Becky has started a book club at Bridging the Gap. We read all kinds of books on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just made me more, more um, I would certainly say careful, mm -hmm. but not in a way that let's, doesn't allow me to get to know the candidate. It's just, a, a, I would say, a greater respect for the variety and the diversity of experiences and family backgrounds and economic backgrounds that each candidate possesses. Mm -hmm. And so you've applied this learning from her into how you interview at Bridging the Gap. Absolutely. Absolutely. What and how we impact? recruit. Okay. How we recruit. Yeah. I mean, so we, what have been the impacts of those changes? Oh, well, I mean, we're, first of all, we're trying now that we have a workforce development program, mm -hmm. we need to find people with barriers to employment and barriers to employment are federally dis defined uh, it can range from anything like not having a high school diploma, not having uh, a ride to work, to having a really serious felony on your record and having served 30 years in prison. Mm -hmm. We've had all of those kinds, all of that range of folks working for us for the next, for the last several years. Um, so I feel like uh, that has absolutely, in the recruiting process, we've realized we can't just go out and put an advertisement in Nonprofit Connect. Mm. We need to go to unusual places where word of mouth might spread. That could include churches, restaurants, mm. um, union halls. Uh, actually, union halls are not that great because they pay way better than we do. But <laughs> um, we pay pretty well. But you know what I'm saying. Right. Uh, I mean, we work to pay to pay well. We pay, sure. for, for one thing in our workforce development program, we pay a, pay a fair wage. We do not pay a minimum wage. So wages mm. are really important. But yeah, the point is are. that we have to go to unexpected places, mm -hmm. especially to reach people who are lower in income, may not have um, digital connectedness mm -hmm. and so forth to try and find those those folks. Right. Yeah. I think you just upended so many assumptions that people have about, you know, something as simple as hiring uh, that, that we, you know, just posted on Craigslist or posted here. It almost sounds like what you're describing in, and especially in terms of connecting with and serving um, populations that might be disadvantaged for employment is that it's a, like a community building activity in and of itself that, um, you know, finding those places where word of mouth can spread and people are just connecting in, in a sense of community to present those opportunities there. Right. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I would say another thing that I would throw out there is historically black college are the bomb in terms of getting those uh, relationships going in the networking uh, that you need to get. Um, and we are very proud now. I think we have seven or eight, um, nine people of color out of our 27. So we're at 33% on diversity, which is still a little bit low for what it should be for Kansas City, Missouri, but we're, we're getting there. And once you have those people on staff, then you've got access to some of the other net networks. Right. And what, you know, as that shift occurred, diversifying your own workforce and serving a more diversified workforce development effort, what, were there challenges involved? Like how, how did that impact culture or was resistance? You know, I'm curious just to hear, uh, cause oftentimes, you know, we, we have to confront our privilege when, when we create a more diverse environment that some people might resist or um, struggle with such a change. Well, it's uh, for all white people, that is an ongoing process of education mm -hmm. to understand what these groups that have been historically oppressed actually have experienced and continue to experience on a daily basis. So I, I, can, I cannot say that we've done it even, I, I, even average well, uh, mm -hmm. but we're, tr we're trying uh, with efforts like our book club, which um, takes us through, and I can't, I know you're gonna ask me the title of this and I can't think of it right now, but I'll find it later. But it's a book that we've, um, that we've used that addresses that white privilege question. And it's a question and answer format. Mm. So we've all had to describe situations from our life where we know that we've been the beneficiary of white privilege. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're kind of in a continual process of investing and trying to um, raise our own awareness. Of, of these issues and create safe spaces at work for our employees who uh, maybe need to talk with other employees of color, for example. Um, you know, mentorship and, and that kind of thing is, I think, valuable in, in the workplace when you're talking about diversity issues. Right, yeah. And have you had to address any resistance um, from, from members of the team around making these changes and doing this educational effort? No, not resistance per se, but let's just say that, you know, last year with George Floyd, j just, it was painful for everybody. It, we knew, we, everybody was in pain about it, but our black employees were particularly, it, it, it was devastating. Yeah. And it was happening at the same time. There was a lot of really nasty stuff politically. And also, I, my, I think the pandemic came after that. But still, it was a rough year. And it, I think making sure that we know how people are emotionally, hmm. especially in workforce development, where it's easy for non-work issues to bleed into workplace for performance, because people's lives have been so uh, under-resourced and in some cases chaotic, that th those problems can be brought to the workplace. And so I, as, as a management person, I feel like one of the things that we will do more and more is to understand the total person mm -hmm. the, and that performance at work is strongly correlated with how things are going at home, even as simply as, did you get a good night's sleep? Right. Are you exercising? Are you, are you eating? And these are things that an, empl an employee, an employer cannot uh, force on an employee, but yet culturally at work, we can support those things. Uh, we right. can support people not working a ridiculous number of hours. We can support people not answering their emails at one o'clock in the morning. We can support by having mm -hmm. food that's actually nutritious <laughs> offering uh, training yeah. and things like that. So there's a lot that we can do to encourage people. At Bridging the App, we do a lot of walking at work. We mm -hmm. meet and walk at the same time. So we, we know how important that physical exercise is as well. Right, yeah. Well, and I love just that acknowledgement of the whole person being part of your 
the organization because we, you know, so typically just think, oh, people can check their personal things at the door and it's, it's not true. And so allowing for the whole person, their feelings, their struggles to be present at work and supporting them through that is in and of itself a, quite a unique and radical management tactic that is we're seeing makes a difference. Um, well, and it's certainly a way of, to differentiate your organization from a lot of other places because it's right. a, a lot of places that's just not, not practiced. Yeah. And it also makes me think too, you know, because what you're describing is working with the complex system of, of individuals and, and the way we have these other relationships at work, outside of work, personal things that have happened in our past or our struggles in our current that just impact everything about the way we are. And yep. a lot of the work you do at Bridging the Gap is with complex systems on a macro level there within True. the community. True. Um, and that is something that I, I so admire about what Bridging the Gap does is navigating these complex systems within municipalities and existing organizations and, and existing cultures within the community. And I'm wondering, what has that been like for you to drive change in a really established, complicated system that might be resistant to that change or um, just even sometimes feel like it won't change? Yeah, well, we don't know that we can do it, but we're gonna go down fighting, right? I mean, we don't know that we can change the minds of decision makers around the world and have them invest in green spaces as opposed to in investing in more gray infrastructure uh, or invest in renewable energy when they could be investing in fossil fuels. I mean, that this enormous shift has to take place and in a, in a relatively short time from a historic standpoint. So. I think a long time ago, I realized I may not be able to do anything significant. And so I keep my expectations about that fairly low, but I'm gonna go down tr trying. And everybody that I work with, I think feels that way. We're gonna go down fighting. So what um, does that look like fighting in a complex system? Well, let's just take the example of urban forestry, for example for a minute, which yeah. is one of our major, it's our largest program these days, to try and convince city council mm -hmm. of KCMO, which is a super budget strapped city because it's so enormous. Mm -hmm. Not many people know that KCMO is one of the most um, sprawled cities in America. It's the size of New York or San Francisco, but it has only 1 40th of the taxpayers base supporting all of those street lights and all of that water piping and, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's a super budget strapped city to begin with. And to go in there and say, yes, potholes are important. Yes, cleaning snow quickly is important, mm -hmm. but even more important, let's pay attention to the tree canopy of our city. And they're all like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And it takes years in, in my experience and you have to go at it in multiple ways to try and get that on people's radar because they're too worried about potholes or mm -hmm. worried about their, and the worries that they have are very valid. It's not that these things are, um, make those problems less valid. It's just mm -hmm. a new set of things that we're trying to bring to their attention. So right. I would say things take a longer than you think it mm -hmm. can, and yet suddenly there'll be some kind of seismic or tectonic shift in people's attitudes, which I feel like in the last two or three years about climate change has really palpably happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so you got to believe that all the seeds that you sowed along the way, not, certainly yeah. not just me, but right. all of the thousands of people across the, the country and the globe who are working on yeah. these issues, those seeds come eventually to bear fruit. Yeah. Um, and you, you got to just hang on to that. It, it yeah. never feels that way when you're doing it, well, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's so easy to get bogged down and especially, you know, not, I think we, we have a propensity for negativity bias. So it's easy to fixate too on what we aren't doing um, or what hasn't right. gone well, instead of recognizing that these efforts 
we are doing something. We are doing what's within our control, which is showing up fighting, you know, and willing to to take that on uh, and and to approach it, as you mentioned, from multiple angles. And I was I was wondering if you could illuminate for us like what what are the different angles or or ways that you approach like that forestry example again? So you know, you present to city council on it, but I'm assuming it didn't just stop there. There were other other ways you advocated. So where did that happen? Every every point on the compass that you can find. Uh, one of the things that we did was we uh, convened a, a group of uh, what we called tree champions. Mm -hmm. And I forget how often we were meeting, but we met about a year for a year and a half. I think it must've been once a month. And we had 60 people from different walks of life, including some elected officials, including private landowners, including some corporate leaders. And we did whatever we had to do to get them to show up, uh, including Irish whiskey or, <laughs> you know, every good snack that you can think of. Um, we held the meetings uh, in interesting locations. We got people to present that wouldn't have otherwise presented. Uh, we made them advocate for a particular tree species, and they they picked one and they you know gave up and got up and gave a you know fourth grade style presentation about their tree. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to get into the human psyche from a lot of different directions, inclu right. and including the stomach and the palate, um, are are some of the ways. Um, we were fortunate that Troy Schulte, the former city manager of KCMO, mm -hmm. had was himself an Eagle Scout. Mm -hmm. And he had a son who was getting his Eagle Scout uh, certification or badge or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. And they would show up at our tree planting events. Mm -hmm. And Troy Schulte was a big man, like 6'5 or bigger. And that man can plant trees. <laughs> and so when we would go to city council, we could say, and your city manager, who in mm -hmm. fact is the most powerful person in office in KCMO, had his rear end in the air with a shovel and was planting trees all weekend. And yeah. we, you know, we talked to them about, we talked to businesses. We, um, the Kansas City Industrial Council is a partner of ours. And after the, the uh, writing of our urban forest master plan, which was what the tree champions were doing for a year mm -hmm. and a half, was finally passed by city council. And the K Kansas City Industrial Council said, well, how can we be tree champions? What can we right. do? You know, when they heard about this work and we're like, are you kidding? Corporate or corporate campuses need to be covered with trees. You're going to reduce your utility bills. Your employees yeah. are going to be able to concentrate better. They're going to have fewer sick days. We mm. could show them all the studies that that was the case. And sure enough, they ponied up and they planted trees and agreed to water them. So, right. but that's kind of like keeping a balloon in the air. You've got to, you've got to keep doing it. You can't stop. It has to be constant. Right. Well, and what I hear about the approach you took is uh, something that I think Chip and Dan Heath call the loose ties, you know, uh, or maybe it's another author, but, um, <laughs> but really leveraging those loose ties, those loose connections where uh, we're, we're building the community, we're, we're connecting with different people of, of influence from different facets of life. We're empowering them, we're engaging them, we're getting them excited, we're giving them responsibility, we're appealing to their the purposeful side, we're appealing to their palates, um, just all of these different facets of who they are, and and just really almost creating this ecosystem around this idea. It's a good analogy. That, yeah, thank you for that. Anytime, right? <laughs> that really allowed it to take its to to create its own life, um, right? And well, and become something and bigger than just bridging the gap. Um, it, it's, it's sure. something that the community as a whole could have pride in. And, and you know, it was Bob Mann who 30 years ago said, people learn best by doing mm -hmm. and putting a shovel in their hand and getting them to plant a tree. It's like a lion goes over and urinates on, a, on his territory, right? I mean, psychologically, yeah. that's what happens. People plant a tree and that's like my tree. And every time I drive by it, I'm going to wave to my tree and talk to my tree. And that we have to exploit all of those tendencies in the human psyche and use them for our benefit. And I, I just wrote a, an article on this on the, that very same thing, the psychology of energy efficiency, mm -hmm. trying to help people get going on energy efficiency, which is really challenging because mm -hmm. it's energy efficiency is invisible. And it's mm -hmm. 
it can be really unpleasant. There's mouse (laughs) droppings down there. And, you know, I mean, you've got to crawl around in attic spaces and basement spaces to do it. So getting people, uh, getting that to be a visible part of people's lives, getting them to see it as part of their norm is a, it's a big battle and it, it, you have to use everything you've got to throw at it. Yeah, and really make it experiential. Really give them a way to engage, Absolutely. a way to be a part of a part of it, a way to get their hands in the dirt, literally and figuratively. Right, for sure. I wonder as we we wrap up. This time has gone by so fast. Um, I would love to hear what are you excited about moving forward for bridging the gap. I'm excited by a couple things that we've already mentioned. Um, one is this growing awareness of the importance of environment through globally mm-hmm. and locally and nationally. Just the understanding that we can't destroy all the green spaces that we have and have it be hunky-dory for humans. It's just yeah. not. Uh, so the, the awareness of that, the excitement and the interest of, of every third grader in mm-hmm. these issues, as well as older people. I go and talk to my mom's retirement community every year on Earth Day and they're excited. They want, they want to do something about it. So that's super exciting. I would say also equally the, the awareness that's been raised by the tragedy of George Floyd and all the other unjust deaths Mm. and the awareness of how inequitably wealth is distributed in our country Mm -hmm. and also around the world. I think, I think we're at a new place that opens up some new possibilities for the redistribution of wealth without using maybe the communism model. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how, how does that happen? It happens probably with something more like what happens in Norway or Sweden or England or Canada, the way wealth is distributed in those places. But somehow this enormous state of inequity where you have a handful of people owning 80% of the nation's assets and you have 30% of your population that can't, is barely making it. Right. You can't, that's not a recipe for a, for a country to do well. Mm-hmm. And I think there's growing awareness of that too. So those two things, awareness of environment, awareness of equity right. are things that are exciting me right now. And particularly within that, on the equity, the, the intersection of those two things, environment and equity, for me is the utility bill burdens that are being borne by lower income people who unfortunately happen to be highly associated with households of color. Mm-hmm. And that is something that we can do something about. And it, it, uh, it needs to be done not only for to reduce greenhouse gases but, and to reduce people's utility bills, but it needs to be done for their health. Right. That they're not baking in homes all winter or all summer and yeah. freezing all winter, which is which undermines health, the quality of air that's being breathed at home, all of these things. So we have a very specific focal point to work on. And for me, the starting point is lower income apartment buildings, which are very cheaply built right. and leaky from an energy mm-hmm. standpoint. So that's what excites me right now is having wow. a chance to work on that. Wow. I can't wait to see where you go with those efforts at bridging the gap, um, because you're right, it, there is such immense need uh, to address those disparities. Uh, and, and you know, we, I think it's uh, ingenuine to say that you, you truly care about other people and not recognize those disparities that need to be addressed. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> right. So thank you so much for sharing with us today your story. I, if people want to learn more about Bridging the Gap or connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? So uh, there's a million, bridging, literally a million Bridging the Gaps in America, but we happen to be bridgingthegap.org. Okay. And uh, if you go, there's a, on our website, it says about us. And underneath that is staff. Mm-hmm. You can find my um my email address, and you'll also see a lot of other staff members who are experts in recycling or forestry or some of, or prairie conservation and restoration, all of that stuff. So yes, absolutely. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you, Ariana. Thanks for the opportunity to share, uh, to share what, what we, what we continue to learn over and over again, it seems like. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today for co-creators in conversation. It's been wonderful to chat with you, Kristen, and we'll have the link in the show notes and would love to hear from listeners too. What's one thing that you have uh, gleaned from this conversation that's going to impact the way you show up? What are you going to do about it? Uh, I think that that's where things are really interesting is when we gain inspiration from conversations like this and do something about it. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to see future co-creators in conversation ses interview sessions, please subscribe. Um, thank you again so much, Kristen, and everyone for joining us today. Thanks to everybody who listened in. And thanks, Ariana. <laughs>